Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, May 2nd, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight. Surprise, surprise. The CIA wants to keep the 28 pages secret. After that, even the formerly crew supporting media admits his defeat. And those quick to point out other types of violence are surprisingly quiet when it comes to the anti-Trump riots. That's next. You wouldn't know what a Nazi was. Why are you acting like a Nazi now? It's you, bro. Why are you here supporting Trump? Why do you support Trump? You're a idiot. Why are you Well, this weekend, you may have noticed, if you follow the CIA on Twitter, that is, of course, they're following everybody else, but the CIA was tweeting out details of the bin Laden raid on the fifth anniversary, according to the official story. Now, that's just so that you don't forget the official government conspiracy story there. If you do, you can go back and watch Zero Dark Thirty, but of course, that also has about as much connection to the actual raid as Die Hard has to 9-11. But it's interesting that Seymour Hersh, uh, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning author, investigator, he's been on the Alex Jones show multiple times, he's coming out with a book called The Killing of Osama Bin Laden. And there were some interesting comments that he made in an interview regarding the, the pending release of this book. Now, of course, when we look at the secrecy that shrouds the things that the CIA does, especially when they do targeted assassinations of people, and the lies that are put out with that. It's difficult to discern the details. But I think what's important that Seymour Hirsch has here is the relationships that are starting to unfold here. And a large part of why these relationships are starting to unfold is because of all the buzz about the secret 28 pages of the official 9-11 report. Now, Seymour Hirsch buys into the idea that Osama bin Laden was really killed in that raid. But he asks and makes some interesting uh, comments in this um, on this interview that he has with Alternet. He says, uh, they ask him, you write that Obama authorized a rat line wherein CIA funneled arms from Libya into Syria and that they ended up in jihadi hands. Now, according to Hirsch, this operation was coordinated via the Benghazi consulate where U.S. Ambassador Stevens was killed. And so they ask, what was Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's role, given her significant role in Libya? And he says, well, the only thing we know is that Hillary was very close to Petraeus who was a CIA director at the time. She is not out of the loop. She knows when there are covert ops. That ambassador who was killed, and this is Seymour Hirsch talking, he was known as a guy, from what I understand, as somebody who would not get in the way of the CIA. As I wrote on the day of the mission, he was meeting with the CIA base chief and a shipping company. And he goes on to say, there's no way somebody in that sensitive of a position is not talking to the boss by some channel. So in other words, what he is saying here is that the false flag sarin gas attack that was launched uh, four years ago in 2012, that was launched as an effort to try to get us involved in the Syrian war. Interesting parallels, isn't it, to the Iraq war. We have an administration, the Secretary of State, and the intelligence community trying to sell us a pack of lies in order to get us involved in another Mideastern war. The only difference is it's the Democrats this time and not the Republicans. And this time, they didn't get away with it. But Seymour Hirsch ties the relationship of Hillary Clinton to not only the catastrophe at Benghazi and the lies that followed it for quite some time, but also to the arms bazaar that came out of all this and saying that they were channeling uh, weapons and arms to the Syrian rebels, which we also know as ISIS. Now, they go on and ask him another question. They say, just to be clear, the U.S. hasn't done anything to punish or at least to disincentivize the Saudis from arming our enemies in Syria. And he says, well, quite the contrary. He said the Saudis and Qatar and the Turks put money into those arms that were sent to Syrian jihadis. And he says, you're asking the right question. Do we say anything? No. Turkey's Erdogan has played a complete double game. For years, he supported and accommodated ISIS. The border was wide open. Guys were going back and forth, bad guys. We know Erdogan's deeply involved. He's changing his tune slightly. 
but he's been deeply involved in this. So again, the important thing that we're starting to see here are the relationships that are developing, and that's why they classified those 28 pages. They didn't want anybody asking uncomfortable questions about our relationship with the Saudis, our relationship with Prince Bondar, who ran Saudi intelligence, and his relationship with the CIA, and therefore the re relationship of the CIA with 9-11. Now, other people have looked at this, and again, when we go back and we look at uh, 2012, 2013, remember how that unfolded. Remember we said from the very beginning that this was being used as a false flag attack. First, it was some Russian people who had pointed that out, and previously there had been UN uh, investigators looking at other sarin gas attacks who said, uh, no, these were carried out by the rebels. So we know that they had some capability, and eventually we had U.S. intelligence come in. And if you look at this report here from the MIT Science Technology and the Global Security Working Group, and these are people who are former uh, UN weapons inspectors, and they talk about the uh, various aspects of this, saying these were improvised chemical munitions. They had a limited range of only about two kilometers. And if you look at all of this, the UN independent assessment of the range and the chemical munitions is in exact agreement with our findings. In other words, they say mistaken intelligence, it wasn't mistaken, could have led to an unjustified U.S. military action based on false intelligence. No, it was simply a pack of lies to get us involved in another war. And they point out that... Uh, Whatever the reasons for this egregious errors in the intelligence, we know what the reasons were, okay? We've been through this before. It's not the public's first rodeo. And that's the good news, is that people are beginning to wake up to these patterns of lies. And so it's very interesting when we look through the relationships of what they're talking about here, the connection that he makes between CIA Director John Brennan Saudi intelligence chief Prince Bandar and Saudi Arabia's interior ministry, as well as the joint chiefs of staff. And I find it interesting that as this is coming out this weekend, we also see CIA director John Brennan pushing back against the idea that the 28 pages have valuable information. As a matter of fact, he calls it inaccurate information. This is the guy who tried to sell us the sarin gas attack to try to get us involved in Syria. And of course, he's coming out, pushing back, throwing the FBI investigators and others under the bus, saying that this report contains inaccurate, unvetted information that could be used to tie Saudi Arabia to the 2001 tax on uh, September the 11th. And we know that that is true. We know that much has been leaked and implied uh, by people like Bob Graham, former Senator Bob Graham, who was head of the Senate Intelligence Committee, who was on the 9-11 Commission, along with many others. Uh, Democrats, Republicans, you have uh, John Kerry, Senator John Kerry, you have uh, Lehman, who was with uh, Reagan uh, as Navy Secretary, all saying there is absolutely no reason for this to be classified, except, except that it shows the relationships. Once we start to see the relationships, and again, the details are not clear, the details don't need to be clear at this point. What we need to understand are the relationships between these players who keep everything secret, who lie about all the details. That's what the American people need to see. That's why these pages need to be declassified because we're going to start to see that unravel. And we're gonna talk about the European Union and the globalist plans unraveling yet, but I wanna mention one more thing while we're on the military. There was a uh, op-ed piece by Ron Paul today, drafting women means equality and slavery. And he makes some very important statements here. And we need to remember this as we're looking at the feminization of the military. Understand that just this last, uh, I think it was Thursday or Friday, they announced that they will now have, for the first time, the dean of West Point will be a woman. This is the first time this has happened. Now, she's going to be a social science professor. I'm sure she will put forward all the political correctness that Obama and the left wants to be fed to the leaders of the military. The way the structure is set up in West Point is close as I can understand. They have a superintendent underneath him, and of course right now he's a male, he's got to go. That's, he's, they've got to get him out real quickly because they're almost at the point where they have a full female leadership there. They had the first female commandant of West Point appointed back in January. Now they're going to appoint the first female dean. And the way the structure is set up under the dean is the academics and under the commandant is the military training. So now we've got women in both of those positions. We just need to get one at the very top. 
so we can have all women there. But this is what Ron Paul says about the draft, and this is why they now want to draft women. They're pushing women into the military. The Star Wars uh, movies, Disney is pushing that narrative very hard in everything that they do. I mean, even uh, if you look at um, Jungle Book at the end, they gave a very large role to the female of the pack, and then they, uh, who, who raised uh, the boy. And at the very end of the movie, she becomes leader of the pack. Yeah, you see that in nature, don't you? Of course, they also don't talk, but we'll ignore that for right now. Getting back to drafting women means equality and slavery. This is what Ron Paul says. He said, last week, the House Armed Services Committee approved an amendment of the National Defense Authorization Act requiring women to register with selective service. That means that if Congress ever brings back the draft, women will be forcibly sent to war. And he says this. He says, unfortunately, the militarism that has led so many conservatives astray in foreign policy has also turned many of them into supporters of mandatory selective service registration. In other words, a draft. Yet many of these same conservatives strongly and correctly oppose mandatory gun registration. In a free society, you should never have to register your child or your gun. Let me repeat that. In a free society, you should never have to register your child or your gun with the government, and you shouldn't have to register yourself either. Now, as we began the, the uh, news, we're talking about how the narrative of the conspiracies that the uh, CIA and the rest of our secret government has concocted here are starting to unravel. We also see globalism perhaps beginning to unravel, and that may be through the Brexit vote, the uh, vote to see whether or not Britain will exit the EU. NBC says this, the Brexit vote, why Britain could quit the EU and why America cares. And they talk about a few things here and say, well, what is at stake? And they answer, well, the global order is at stake. And that, folks, is the key. This is about the globalism, about the consolidation. As we pointed out many times, the structure that was set up by Zbigniew Brzezinski and the Trilateral Commission and the Rockefellers who created the Trilateral Commission, they want to create these regional blocks that they can then consolidate into a global government. And the regional blocks are first economic consolidation. Then they become political consolidation. And what we see right now with the open borders is an attempt to erase completely the borders and the cultures and the sovereignty of these individual nations. As Europe sees this, there are rising political movements that are pushing back against it. The same thing is happening in America. And the question is, how will this turn out? We will get some idea as we look at their election coming up with the Brexit election, as well as what happens with the American election. They point out that if Britain leaves, it will be abandonment of the EU by one of its most important members. And some predict a domino effect as other EU members consider their own departures, while other members fear that an EU without Britain would be economically dominated by Germany, which is perhaps why Sweden has said, if Britain leaves, we're going to have a vote on leaving as well. I think there's a lot of countries that do not want to be totally dominated by Britain, but that is already happening to a large degree. Now, they say, why does it matter for the United States? Well, this is NBC's answer. They say the United States advocates a strong and stable union. Um, well, it isn't just that, folks. It is the trilateral consolidation that we're talking about here. And it's also the transatlantic and transpacific partnerships that make that consolidation happen first economically. Why is this happening now, they say? Why are they pushing back? Well, of course, it's an uptick in immigration, says NBC. No, it's a massive destruction of, by design, our cultures and our borders. They say the trading bloc is arguably the world's first attempt at creating a super state in the modern world. They say a series of treaties have given courts and politicians in Brussels the power to change national laws to bring them in line with European standards. Yeah, of course, that's the whole problem. You know, we had uh, when, when uh, Boris Johnson, the mayor of London, who is advocating that Britain exit, when he was going back and forth with um, Obama, everybody seized on what he had to say about the Churchill bust to try to make Boris Johnson look like a racist. But as I reported last week, he made it very clear that they don't have a relationship with the United States right now where they can do a trade agreement. They have to worry about uh, whether the French are on board, and they've got their own ancillary issues with uh, cheeses, for example, okay? So it's a very complicated thing. These things are being decided not by Britain and the United States, 
but they're being decided by Brussels. And so Britain already is at the back of the queue. And then they go on and say, well, how could it affect the U.S. election? It actually reflects the U.S. election. That is what's going on with Donald Trump. Do they think this is really going to happen? Of course they do. This is Financial Times saying the Bank of England is busy preparing for the Brexit vote. It's very close right now. They're essentially tied statistically. And we're uh, probably, I guess it's about, uh, I think it's the end of June, June 23rd. So we're about uh, seven weeks out. A lot of things can happen at this point. We've had a lot of people coming in. Uh, talking about uh, why they should stay, why they should leave. The Leave campaign has just come back with its own economists. First of all, they didn't hear anything uh, that said, uh, that offered an, a positive case, except for uh, the people who were offering a fear case. Now, the people who are saying we need to leave have put up their own economists. We have an article on InfoWars, how Brexit could help all of Europe, saying that this will actually bring in more competition between government. Look, here's the bottom line. Whenever you have government that is closer to the people, it serves the people. The farther removed government becomes, the more consolidated government becomes, the more people become slaves. And the issue before us now, the key issue in our election, in the British election, is are we, are we going to have nations or are we going to have a new world order, a globalist order? So it's globalism versus the nation state. That's why all eyes are on Britain and all eyes are in the American election. Stay with us. We'll be right back. And the next president of the United States, Ted Cruz. Ouch, you just saw Carly fall for Ted Cruz there pretty hard. Uh, right off of the uh, podium there, into the mosh pit. And as our article points out, she drops just like Cruz is dropping in the polls. And I think it's kind of interesting to look at Heidi's reaction when you watch that. She kind of moves forward as if she's going to try to catch her and then decides at the end, well, maybe I just pretend I didn't really see that. But equally funny is Jeb Bush's comments about Carly and Cruz. And he said, I'm impressed with her. Well, hey, you know, there you go. But Jeb is a mess. And isn't it the kiss of death? For Jeb Bush to come out and endorse you, I mean, it has been in the past. He says she's tough. Let's hope so. Uh, let's hope she survived that fall. Uh, he says she's someone who's got a proven record. Picking a candidate that is talented, tough, um, you know, she takes on Trump really well, I think, and she takes on Hillary Clinton very well as, as well. Someone who's got a proven record and who's been vetted as a candidate, uh, I thought was, was a smart move by Ted Cruz. What was her proven record? As CEO of Hewlett Packard, uh, where they lost half of their stock, tanked like a Greek bank during the banking crisis. And of course, uh, she's got a proven record of working with the NSA and the CIA in terms of helping them to uh, sell the idea of surveillance over the U.S. population. Say she's been vetted as a candidate. That's what Jeb said. She's been vetted as a candidate. Yes, she has. And like Jeb, She's been rejected when she was vetted. And she was rejected in California as well. She ran there for Senate. I don't know how in the world she is supposed to help uh, Ted Cruz in California when she was thoroughly rejected by the people of California once they realized who she was, what her history was there uh, with Hewlett Packard. But you know, we've got Ted Cruz who is totally disconnected from reality. And remember, Last week, as we had the five states uh, voting in the Northeast, and the week before that, we had New York. Out of the last six contests, Ted Cruz has lost five of those six. He's come in third in all but one. I'm sorry, he lost all six, and he came in third place in five of those six. He averaged 15%, and yet we're supposed to believe that somehow, if he wins in Indiana, everything is going to turn around. No, it isn't. He just missed out on pretty much all of the 267 delegates that were up for grabs. And now, even if he gets the, all of these 57 delegates, it isn't going to do it for him. Look, as these delegates have been allocated, and it takes several days for these delegates to be allocated uh, throughout these states because they have to be done by congressional districts in most of these places. Here's where it stands right now. Ted Cruz has 565 delegates. Donald Trump has 996. There's only 571 remaining. That means Donald Trump needs only 42% of the remaining delegates to get to the magic 1237. Ted Cruz, however, needs 118. But of course, it's all going to turn around, isn't it? I don't think so. And not even the mainstream media believes that anymore. Look at this article from Infowars.com. 
Uh, once he tacitly accepted the party's embrace, he began to morph from a conservative stalwart to an opportunist. That's someone from the Hill saying, he said, the end of the beginning came in mid-March when establishmentarian Lindsey Graham endorsed Ted Cruz. And it's also the kiss of death when you get the endorsement of Jeb Bush. And then we had the uh, so-called victory in Wisconsin, which they say the media portrayed as a product of an unholy alliance. No, it was a product of an unholy alliance with the establishment. It wasn't uh, when he tacitly accepted this. This is when he unmasked and showed it. And we see this happening with even Politico, who is kind of on the never Trump train. Uh, this is their headline says, Inside Cruz's Camp, Confidence Crumbles. Yeah. That's the reality of what's going on here. They say many top figures in the party are convinced that a loss on Tuesday would be the end of the road. A political strategist for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce says a cruise loss in Indiana means lights out, game, set, match. Yeah, that would be Indiana be game. The set would be the nomination and the general election would be the match. And I think that's what's going to happen with the dreamer riots that we have seen. I think that's going to be game, set, match for Donald Trump. Newt Gingrich says... If Trump wins Indiana, he is the nominee, not the presumptive nominee. He says uh, that we've seen some polls that put Trump up by 15 points in Indiana. He says if that's true and he wins Indiana by a significant margin, then the fact is the next morning he is the nominee, not the presumptive nominee. He is the nominee. It's going to happen. Take a look at these polls from Real, Real Clear Politics. Look at the trend that's happening here. What they do is they average these polls together, but they've also got them in chronological order. You can see that uh, the oldest one, Trump was up plus two, then Trump up plus nine, then plus 15. That's the one that Gingrich was talking about. Now we've had another one come out at plus 17. It looks to me like the momentum is not on Cruz's side. Mike Huckabee says this, Indiana is a make or break for Ted Cruz. He says he's already been mathematically eliminated. We just talked about that. He says Cruz picked up a valuable endorsement from the Indiana governor but its impact was blunted when Pence spent much of his time praising Donald Trump before endorsing Cruz, he said. And he says, as a former governor myself, this is what I had to say yesterday, uh, I think it's much more important that he got the endorsement of the basketball coach there in Indiana, uh, Knight. And he says, I have to admit that if any candidate in Arkansas had a choice between my endorsement or a nod from the coach of the University of Arkansas, they'd be crazy to pick me. Joe Scarborough had this to say about uh, the Indiana governor's endorsement. He says, Pence endorsed Trump more than he did Cruz. He says, if somebody endorsed me that way, I would go on the radio the next hour and say, he can take his blinking endorsement back. He said, that was no endorsement. And he says, uh, well, this is what some of the stuff that uh, the governor said. He says, I'm also particularly grateful that Donald Trump has taken a strong stand for Hoosier jobs. When he saw jobs in the carrier company abruptly announce leaving Indiana, not for another state, but for Mexico, he spoke up. And that's where Trump went. He went to address the people there at the uh, crowd while uh, you've got uh, Ted Cruz going to the GOP establishment. So he's saying all this stuff about Ted, Cr about uh, Donald Trump and his voters. And then he just comes and says, uh, well, but I'm going to vote for Ted Cruz. Trump told Fox News he thought Pence gave me more of an endorsement than he did Cruz. And then we look at what's happening with the delegates. This is, I think, another key reason why people are fleeing Ted Cruz. Look at what happened in Arizona. You've got Jan Brewer, the former governor, governor and she tweeted out uh, this weekend. She says, I've been elected to five straight national conventions. Today I got cheated. My name was mysteriously removed off of the online ballot because they know she is a Trump supporter. See, this is not about politics. This is not about Ted Cruz having a better organized ground game. This is simply about uh, pushing his way through and removing people like the former governor right off of the ballot. We had a caller yesterday on the uh, Alex Jones show in the Sunday edition. She was a Virginia delegate and she had been a former Cruz supporter. She had this to say. There were supposed to be over 5,000 delegates um, that uh, were supposed to attend, but we ended up with less than 3,000 that showed up. We were given a list of 78 uh, delegates to go to the National Convention. Uh, 27 of those delegates had committed to Cruz, 16 committed to Trump. Uh, we had 32 that were undeclared and three for Kasich. And at the end of the, the day when we were ready to vote, they handed us what they call a slate. And this is 
I'm not exactly sure how they choose these 13 delegates to go to the National Convention out of the 78 that we were given, but we ended up with 10 crews delegates going to the National Convention and three Trump in a state where Donald Trump won 35 percent of the popular vote and Ted Cruz won 17 percent. Now, I, I was a voter in favor of Ted Cruz, so I'm not like he wanted to stay on Hannity. I'm not a Trump whiner that's complaining about this delegate process, but it was obvious to me at the end of the day that this was this was rigged. Now, of course, with all that happening, Cruz still denies that if he loses tomorrow, it's the end of the road. When asked that, he said, of course not. It's going to be a battle to see who can earn a majority of the delegates elected by the people at the convention. Ah, but that's the point. They're not being elected by the people. And as George Will said in his column, if Donald Trump wins the nomination, our first duty is going to make sure that he loses all 50 states because they want Hillary in because it's about globalism. Now stay with us when we come back. Jakari Jackson's got a report about the Detroit schools stealing the pensions of the teachers. And then we're going to have some compilations of more protest videos that you haven't seen. Stay with us. We'll be right back. You've heard it said a honest day's work for an honest day's pay, but what if you're not getting your paycheck? That seems to be the situation going on in Detroit. Michigan has many other problems, you know, the Flint water crisis and the rest of it. But I woke up this morning and I saw the news that over the weekend, the teachers in Detroit came to the realization that come June 30th, uh, the funds were pretty much going to run out for the uh, teachers there and also the after school activities, summer activities. And now we see the article 94 of 97 Detroit public schools closed due to teacher sick house. So basically, uh, the teachers there were encouraged to call in sick, and this was the Detroit Federation of Teachers. They were encouraging their peers. They said, hey, just call in sick to work and let people understand how big of an issue this is. And to be quite honest, have the teachers not done this, I don't think it would be a big national issue now. Now, the report says that they have about 47,000 students enrolled in DPS, and the teachers there make an average salary of about $63,000. Now, one of the things that they've been debating for a long time is that teachers don't get paid enough. Many people make that argument, and when you consider that they're not uh, even considering paying these guys for an extended period of time, that number drops down quite a bit. And this is just one aspect of it. If you guys recall last week, we brought you another report about how pensions weren't being paid properly. We see the report, DPS kept millions intended for pensions. A report from a retired federal judge, Stephen Rhodes, noted that the federal government says the district didn't properly forward between 25 and $30 million in federal funds to the Michigan Public School Employees Retirement System. So not only are they threatening not to pay these guys up front, also on the back end, you may not even get your pension because they're playing funny money with the pensions. And it reminds me of the various stories we've seen all over the years from the various places, not just in Detroit, one in particular, uh, a gentleman who was a retired firefighter, if I remember correctly, was told basically that he's going to have to get a second job because he wasn't going to get his pension. Alfred Arnold was Pritchard's first black firefighter. He retired after 35 years as a captain. If I didn't retire, I might not make it the next day going on the fire. You know, it was just it was too strenuous, you know. So I had to retire because I had heart problems. Attorney Scott Williams represents the city of Pritchard. If we took all the city's money and paid it to the pensioners, we won't have money to pay for the fire department or to keep the street lights on. And yes, they do need to keep the other city operations active, but at the same time, you can't rob Peter to pay Paul. If the mayor is so concerned about keeping the city running, I think he should just work for free and give the pensions to the police officers, firefighters, and so forth, who have invested so much of their time and energy into these cities. You can find more reports on InfoWars.com. According to a Pew Research poll, mainstream media has a 6% approval rating. Think about that. The globalist megabanks controlling the perception of the American masses for their own gain isn't a passive event. What lurks behind that dismal approval rating is a roaring distrust that will eventually morph into a hammer of truth, shattering all of the propaganda 
clamoring for the attention of 320 million people. That bubble of overpaid sophist minions churning out their American version of Pravda sat comfortably at the White House Correspondents' Dinner over the weekend, chuckling with sycophantic glee in the presence of the most non-transparent president in the history of the United States of America. Eight years ago, I was a young man, full of idealism and vigor. And look at me now. I am gray grizzled, just counting down the days till my death panel. <laughs> At home and abroad, journalists, like all of you, engage in the dogged pursuit of informing citizens and holding leaders accountable and making our government of the people possible. And it's an enormous responsibility. And I realize it's an enormous challenge at a time when the economics of the business sometimes incentivize speed over depth, and when controversy and conflict are what most immediately attract readers and viewers. Uh, the good news is there's so many of you that are pushing against those trends. And in such a climate, uh, it's not enough just to give people a, a megaphone. And that's why your power and your responsibility to dig and to question and to counter distortions and untruths is more important than ever. Taking a stand on behalf of what is true does not require you shedding your objectivity. In fact, it is the essence of good journalism. But for a brief moment, comedian Larry Wilmore brought some clarity to the dulled senses of the media whores sipping their champagne. MSNBC got rid of so many black people, I thought Boko Haram was running that network. <laughs> what was going on? See, some of America's uh, finest black journalists are here tonight. Um, Don Lemon's here, too. Um... <laughs> hey, Don, how's it going? <laughs> Alleged journalist Don Lemon, everybody. <laughs> but I have to say, it's great. It looks like you're really enjoying your last year of the uh, presidency. Um, saw you hanging out. Uh, with NBA players like Steph Curry, Golden State Warriors. That was cool, that was cool, yeah. You know, it kind of makes sense too because both of you like raining down bombs on people from long distances, right? Yeah, that's true. What, am I wrong? What? <laughs> Speaking of drones, how is Wolf Blitzer still on television? <laughs> Ask a follow-up question. Good <laughs> Hey, Wolf, I'm ready to project tonight's winner. Anyone that isn't watching the Situation Room. <laughs> Who are you killing tonight? <laughs> Can't be print journalism. That industry's been dead for a while now, right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> CNN is here tonight. You mentioned CNN, yep. Um, I've been watching CNN a long time. Yep, used to watch it back uh, when it was a news network. I did. Was it all seen in here tonight? Since the Smith Munt Act was quietly overturned in 2013, legalizing propaganda to be fed to the American people, I humbly call out of pure reason that the Pulitzer, the Emmys, the Peabody, the Edward R. Murrow, and all the other prizes awarded to journalists since 2013 be returned and all of these awards to be put on hold until American journalism is returned to its proper status as stated in the First Amendment. In medical news tonight, a chip the size of a grain of rice could save your life. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna wait around and watch my family die around me. John Bound for Infowars.com. A lot of people are murdered by our United States military for this country. How many countries are we occupying right now that. for that Answer flag? That. That. How many Native Americans died for that flag? That. How many? How many? Answer. Genocide. You're real quiet now. We're talking about genocide. We're talking about colonialism. Genocide. How many people died installing communism in Russia? What the f*** does that have to do with that flag? How many people 
you're a black man standing with these white supremacists. You're standing with Nazis, bro. You're standing with Nazis. We fought against you. We fought against you. We fought against you. We fought against you. Nazis. You're a Nazis. Nazi. Say you're not. And why are you acting like one? Why are you acting like one? You wouldn't know what a Nazi was. Why are you acting like a Nazi then? It's you, bro. Why are you here supporting Trump? Why do you support Trump? And why do you support Trump? Why do you support Trump? Why do you support Trump? My brother, you got a bottle of water. You support Trump. If you got, hang on a second. Hang on a second. If you guys want, I'm listening. Very funny. We Very fought funny. against I'm racism. Listening. Really? Watch out, Nick. Hey. No. Yeah, get the f out. Get the f out. Oh. Come on, hello. We don't support fascism here. We are not for fascism. Trump is fascism. Trump is fascism. Nazis racist KKK. Nazis racist KKK. Trump's a Nazis racist KKK. Nazis racist KKK. Nazis racist KKK. I love you right here. Yeah, these eggs being thrown on the floor, it's because they love us. Don't you guys get it? They love Trump supporters. That's why they beat you up. That's why they beat you up. Wow, that's not even good. Nazis racist KKK. Nazis racist KKK. Nazis racist KKK. Nazis racist Come on, 
ahead, boys. There it is, they're making another Thank you.